Today in episode 60 of the Be A Marketer podcast, you'll hear from an owner with a background in automation software turned chocolatier. And I'm sharing why you should follow the natural rhythms of your business when it comes to marketing. This is the Be A Marketer podcast. Be A Marketer. I'm your host, Dave Charest, Director of Small Business Success at Constant Contact, and I help small business owners like you make sense of online marketing. And on this podcast, we'll explore how to find the time to be a marketer. Remember, friend, you can be a marketer, and at Constant Contact, we're here to help. Well, hello, friend, and thanks for joining me for another episode of the Be a Marketer podcast. You know, near the end of last year and, of course, into this year, I've really been trying to find the times when I am most energized throughout the day so that I can use those times for creative work. And so I've been using my calendar to really hold that time for that type of work and leaving other spots open so I can do those things that really don't require the same creative energy. And I was reminded of this stuff that I've been doing in this idea of working with your natural rhythms from the guest that you're going to hear today. Now, he runs a seasonal business. It, he uses the downtime to, and I'm going to use that term loosely because there's always things to do with your business, of course, but he uses what we'll call downtime to really get other things done, including marketing. And, you know, you may not have a seasonal business per se, but there may be rhythms in your business that really allow you to breathe a bit more. And if you can identify those times, they may be good to take advantage of that time to make plans and really tackle those larger marketing items that maybe you've been meaning to get to. Because as you'll hear from our guest today, and I'm sure you've already found you're not going to have time for marketing and other items when you're really busy within the business. So my question to you is, how can you use the rhythms of your business to find time for marketing? Well, friend, today's guest is Mark Chinsky, co-owner of Anjou Chocolat in Morristown, New Jersey. Founded in 1983, the chocolate shop celebrated its 40th anniversary last year. And it was about a year and a half ago that Mark and his partner Rose bought the business after Mark received a buyout from previous business partners. It wasn't enough to retire just yet. And so Anju offered an opportunity to buy a business that would hopefully continue an income stream. Plus, for Mark, well, it looked kind of fun. After all, people love chocolate. And you get very few unhappy customers when you have a really good chocolate product. Mark's background before getting into the chocolate biz? Enterprise Resource Planning Software, which is software for manufacturing and distribution companies to automate purchasing, inventory, and production management. And so, as you might imagine, Mark spent some time early on updating Anju's out-of-date systems. So here, actually, what a lot of what I focused on in the first year, the prior owner was basically 100% paper-based, literally a giant, you know, cork board with handwritten orders that worked, you know, paper systems sure. have worked for thousands of years, but could only be worked if you were physically in this very small room because there was only one place for it. And <laughs> we completely uh, implemented Shopify or e-commerce and order processing. I've put in a number of customizations to optimize it for our wholesale side of our business because we sell the supermarkets and other regional stores, as well as completely rebuilt the customer facing side of our site. It was very amateurish. The photography, the design was something out of the 1990s (laughs) and so forth. So So tell me a little bit about that then. So you've got a whole side portion of the business. I believe you do some corporate stuff as well. And there's there's an actual physical location, correct? Mm -hmm. And then e-commerce, yeah. Right. So many people know Anju as our retail store here in North Central New Jersey, in Marstown, New Jersey which is famous for George Washington being headquartered here during large chunks of the Revolutionary War. So it's a very historic town with a lot of old buildings. And it's kind of a, if anybody wants chocolate in this 30 mile radius, this is the place they go. They knew it. And that's what I was buying is that reputation and just recognition of the product. And that's represented by, you know, a really interesting retail store. We have hundreds of different products in the store. We're well known for our molded products, 
which are things like if you wanted a you know molded envelope to represent constant contact or the constant contact logo, we can have that embedded in a mold for chocolate. And then from there, we're able to create a circular disc or a chocolate bar or something that goes with an assortment and then constant contact can give it out to prospective corporate clients, to employees for birthdays. We've done work for Lexus, for Sirius XM. We've done work for Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. So a lot of local businesses, CPAs, professionals, and a lot of national companies as well. I'm making a note for our team. I enjoy chocolate as well. <laughs> See if we get some logo. <laughs> right? Here here happens to be one of our, our most popular. This is very popular for birthdays. So you buy, you know, if the person's turning two, there you go. If they're turning <laughs> 22, you put two together. You get two of them. I love so it. So forth. Yep. <laughs> and you can do math with them too, I think, right? You can get two yeah, and you two could. and you get... <laughs> You know, but unfortunately, then you end up eating. Ah, there it is. (laughs) Well, hopefully not, unfortunately, right? That seems like the fun part. (laughs) Well, tell my stomach that. I I was probably 15 pounds lighter before I started. (laughs) But I do, I recall the uh, the producer of the new Willy Wonka movie saying he put on over 25 pounds in the movie because there was so much chocolate around the place and he couldn't control it. Or Timothy Chalet was very restrained (laughs) with it. So tell me a little bit about, you know, as you've, what's it been uh, a couple of years right now since you've- About a year and a half. A year and a half now. Okay. So, I mean, what would you say has been your biggest accomplishment with the business so far? I think our biggest accomplishment is probably the host, the automation of the system. So we can be anywhere. We literally, we put in Ring Central for unified communication. So- you know, in the past, if somebody called the 630 and the store was closed, all they got was a literally cassette tape answering machine. And now we can pick up the call in our car or anywhere. We get voice to text translations with the Shopify. We can see order statuses. We're now in the process of automating production planning with it because now we know what's on order and we can aggregate it, make light things together and make things more efficiently, know when we're going to run out of stock, et cetera. So the automation has been a big part of the business. We also did a light store renovation about seven months ago because it did look kind of 80s with the uh, (laughs) color themes, but we didn't put too much in because we may be moving somewhere nearby in the next year or two, depending on our lease situation here. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, it sounds like you're doing a lot of really great work just in terms of kind of bringing up the technology and doing all of those things. So, I mean, how does that make you feel to get that accomplished? Oh, it's really good. It just does amaze me though how much time things take, you know, over the period, you know, there's still these day-to-day flow of customers coming in. You might be picking up the bell in the background. That means somebody walked in the store. And obviously we have a really good staff for that here. One of the things that has been a lot of work is making sure we absorb all the knowledge from the prior owner so that, you know, again, none of us being chocolate experts originally to make sure that, you know, everything is running smoothly. Things are ordered on time, especially with supermarkets, you have to plan many months in advance of the particular holiday to have the right products out, whether it's bunnies for Easter or hearts for Valentine's, et cetera. Well, how's it been like really, I mean, learning the ins and outs of, I would assume for you is like a whole new industry, right? Yeah, it has. And, you know, unfortunately, at the same point, we walked into the business right before a few macroeconomic things hit Mm. that we didn't have any knowledge of. One of the things in New Jersey, they doubled the minimum wage over a period of two years, and much of our production of our product is made by lower-skilled packaging labor, so that's really hurt. The other thing is the price of cocoa has skyrocketed over 200% in one year, which is way beyond even inflation because of some issues with the heavy rains in Africa, where most of the world's cocoa supply comes from. It's so bad that we were actually just on Fox Business and Fox News last week in a live segment with Dana Perino and Bill Hemmer, and then later with Stuart Barney talking about the whole cocoa issues. So that, of course, all PR is good PR, even if you're talking (laughs) about the need to raise your prices. So Sure. Yeah. So are you manufacturing on site too, or? Yes. So that's a good question. We make almost all of our own products, which is kind of unique. Most chocolatiers basically buy something and rewrap it and then, Mm. you know, package it and sell it. But the vast majority of our items we make And that has also been a challenge because the space in this building, which is probably a 120-year-old building, is limited. And certain pieces of equipment require 14 open feet for cooling. And so, you know, a lot of processes are hand done that we need to automate, get more space. But yeah, everything we, we do, we make ourselves. 
And that we use copper kettle pots, which is pretty rare nowadays, and it gives a unique flavor to our chocolate profile. I'm going to have to place an order of that there, chocolate. (laughs) So, I mean, we're talking about some of the challenges that you've been running into, but what would you say do you love most about it? Yeah, really. Now that I look back, it's probably all negative. But yeah, what I love most about it, it, my favorite part was, so we do a lot of either pop-up sales. We do something called the Chocolate Expo, which is a regional show where all sorts of vendors, chocolate, chocolate wine, the weirdest things that have chocolate in it. And and when you get, you let people sample your product. And we have one particular product, our sea salt caramel. And when they take a bite and you watch their eyes roll up into their head and you're like, oh, I guess this is what their orgasm looks like because... <laughs> I have one video I took on my uh, phone from a fancy wine tasting. This guy was an attorney. You know, he might have been two or three drinks in, but, you know, takes a bite. And I don't know if I can curse on this, but he's basically like, this is the best effing (laughs) thing I have ever effing put in my effing mouth. I was like, wow. So I should order the sea salt caramel. Is that what you're telling me? That's the one that that (laughs) nobody has ever said. This is not amazing. (laughs) Well, so there's a guy that I think a video is a good marketing piece, right, to (laughs) to sell that chocolate. But I guess what level of experience are you bringing in terms of marketing as you come into the business? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the work, I did a lot of the marketing in the IT industry and we used Constant Contact there as well, which worked out well because this owner was also using it. But most of her campaigns were pretty amateurish in terms of the graphics and so forth. And I also was heavily involved in doing a lot of blog writing because in the IT world, having relevant information in a blog is a very strong way to get long tail keyword recognition on Google. I'm never going to win the Googling of the word chocolate. That's Nestle, you know, that's M&M. We're not even going to go there. But we just got a $2,000 order because we have a chocolate dart set. It's a chocolate Uh, dart board with chocolate darts. And a, uh, a new company from the UK that if you've ever been to an axe throwing place, they do dart throwing yeah, restaurants yeah. with bars and they wanted to do a promotion to give away to customers something, you know, that's themed with them. And they found us by Googling and only because we made sure that we try to get all of our products on the web and out there with the proper keyword recognition and description. So that's really important, the kind of stuff that I have to do going through our site. So that's interesting. I mean, are there any other, not to give away like your secrets necessarily, but not every business has the opportunity to kind of find those types of opportunities. And so are you kind of, have you done or are you set to do more of that work to uncover more of those things that you, you know? Yeah. So our business is extremely seasonal. Yeah. You know, we can do in December what we do from June to October combined. So because of that, things are now officially slow here and it's just, it's normal. It's the way people just don't think chocolate in the summer, just like ice cream shops don't do very well in January (laughs) in in the Northeast. So what we're doing, we have 50,000 molds, but we only have about 5,000 products or variations of our products on our website. So if somebody says, hey, do you have a fish hook? And I look on our website and I don't see it. I go into our Excel spreadsheet, which has every mold we have. Oh, we do. It's somewhere. We got to go dig around, grab it and take a look and maybe make a sample. So one of the goals is to go through all of our molds and have our kitchen turn them into a chocolate colored product and then photograph it and describe it and get it on the website because it isn't going to sell if it's sitting in a box upstairs as a as a clear mold, which yeah. is you know what molds look like before the chocolate's poured in them. So as you think through kind of all you have to get done and all that you're trying to do, where would you say marketing ranks on that list of priorities? So marketing is very important. There's only so much, you know, everybody in this area who's going to go out for chocolate is probably already going to come here who's, you know, within a reasonable radius. There's not, there aren't a lot of chocolate shops left like this. You know, those traditional chocolate shops have disappeared as the founders have aged out and young generation doesn't necessarily want it. But if you walk into most supermarkets, the only chocolate they have is either the junk from Nestle's, which if you know chocolate, Nestle's is the chocolate like what Thunderbird is to wine. (laughs) And I mean, it's fine. It's cheap. It's good for, you know, the kids or whatever. But once you've had real chocolate, it's like you can't, you can't go back to that muddy stuff. Or they may have gourmet, but it's all bars. It's just all in the, you know, organic and sugar-free and all these like high cocoa, but you can't get chocolate shop like chocolate there. You can't get sea salt caramels. You can't get truffles. You can't get all those things 
that we have. So I think that's something that from a marketing standpoint, we have to make sure people know is that we have so much more variety than you're ever going to get through a traditional candy store or supermarket type source. Who's involved with marketing now? So right now, it's myself and a relatively new employee, Carol Ann, who has a marketing degree and she's actually playing, you know, we're not a big company. So she has a dual role of helping out on the retail storefront, but also she's doing all of our social media. I trained her on Constant Contact because I was doing all of the campaigns and most of those I inherited from the prior owner. And as I said, they were very amateur looking, you know, the graphics were very weak, the photos were dull. So I've worked on those templates, but now she's working with Constant Contact and making sure that they're LinkedIn Being younger, she's doing all the Instagram and (laughs) those other links that I, you know, my background, I kind of aged out at Facebook. (laughs) And that's important to get a younger crowd because I would say a fair percentage of our customers are older. And to get to the younger crowd, we're going to have to start doing more interesting TikTok type videos and other, you know, social media marketing. Do you embrace that stuff or are you? We absolutely do, but it's been kind of hit or miss. Like, hey, we got somebody, we're going to do one and then we do three. And then a month later, there's nothing new. And I know from experience, you got to, marketing has to be constant and constant, hence constant contact <laughs> over and over and over again. And we were we, onto something there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I'm only one person running that, all these different aspects of the business. So that's why I'm, we're really happy to have Carol Ann aboard so she can really focus the time necessary to make sure that we're always out there in you know messaging in a way there's that fine balance of being spammy and sending sure. too much email which is why constant contact is one component but its ability to integrate with Instagram and etc you know is important so that we can get some of that same messaging out in different channels and we, you know there would be nice to see even more improvements on that front but yeah so when you start thinking about how you're, I guess, focusing on the type of work that the two of you are going to do from a marketing perspective. You know, do you meet, do you talk about goals for the business? And then do you set like what success looks like? Do you do any of that work together? We should, you know, when I came from my corporate background, we did a lot of that stuff, but we are still a mom and pop chocolate shop. So sure. having a lot of meetings and discussions and death by PowerPoint is not <laughs> in the cards here. But the goal, we're always challenging. Do we keep the wholesale going? Do we maybe push more corporate and less wholesale? Because the wholesale had the thin margins. And then when your cost of labor doubles, and right. you know how much can you charge a supermarket who has to then take your product and double it before somebody walks along and says, I, I can't afford this. You know, it's either hamburger meat or chocolate, you know, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. So do you mind sharing maybe where is your What's the breakdown of your business now just in terms of like wholesale, retail, all of that? So right now, I would say it's 40% wholesale, 40% retail, and 20% web and corporate. Is there an ideal state you'd like to get to? Honestly, I would love it through wholesale to be less than 30%, but not at a reduction in overall revenue. I would just like a... because. So basically, for every dollar you sell, you'll make drastically more retail than you do wholesale because you know, of the margin issue. That's not, you know, the revenue doesn't do any good if there's nothing left after you cover all your costs. So when you start thinking about how you're marketing on you now, like what are some of the things that you're doing? So like, just for example, today we're buying ad space in the New Jersey Jewish publications because there's a lot of bar and bat mitzvahs in this region. It has a large Jewish population. Some of our chocolate is kosher and demographically income wise, it's a good fit for our products. So we're trying to pick niche targeted marketing. We cannot afford to be in, you know, your general cable TV, you know, or other large scale advertising because it's too expensive per head and too many of the people are still going to buy their cheap Hershey's chocolate. So we want to go for people who would typically, you know, be looking for something more specialized. We do a lot of wedding based events because we do wedding favors. We do baby showers, bachelor and bachelorette party chocolates, which let's just leave it to the imagination it can be very creative <laughs> and hilarious. And so we're trying to, you know, target specific markets where you can reach people who are in the stage of buying, like they're going to have a wedding and they need favors, you know, much more cost effectively than blast marketing, you know, to television and just general magazines or the newspaper. And again, obviously that's where constant contact comes in because from being in 40 years in business, we have a roughly 16,000 person email list here. The original owner wasn't always great about capturing all those emails, but we've started making sure that wherever possible, when people come in the store, we 
try and capture that. I want to get into some of the things that you're doing with those email addresses and how you're using constant contact as part of that. But before we get there, I'm wondering, what do you find to be the biggest challenge with marketing? I guess the challenge is obviously marketing is not inexpensive. Constant contact's very affordable, but you can only, you know, email people so often, so much. And these are people who already know us. You know, we're not obviously buying random lists and spamming people. So these are people, these are obviously opt-in people that almost every one of them have bought something from us. It's, you know, the challenge is finding new customers who would like our product, but don't know we exist. I mean, an interesting example was when we were on Fox News, the next day, I had a number of customers came in and said, I forgot all about you. I used to go there 15 years ago, but I saw you on Fox this morning. And I was like, oh, I got to get down there. And they came in the store and bought some stuff because it was around Easter time. I'm interested. It sounds like you kind of keep up. Do you see any, notice anything just in terms of like traffic to the website or anything like that after that? It literally was like, you know, it it was more than doubled, you know, right after we were on. And I was really surprised at how many people came in the store and said, I saw you on TV, you know, because it was a morning show. Most of the hits were on Fox Business, which doesn't have nearly the viewership of CNBC, but beggars can't be choosers, (laughs) you know. Take what you can get, right? (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, surprisingly large number of people uh, did see us. What have you been finding? I know you are using that Shopify integration. What are you finding? How is that helping you in terms of, uh, is that saving you time at all? Or what does that do for you? It is because basically anybody that does find us and buys product from us now, then once they become a customer in Shopify, I don't have to do anything. They're automatically now in my constant contact database as long as you know they don't choose to opt out during that process. I believe too, you're also taking advantage of the product blocks in there. Can you talk me through that a little bit? Yeah, we are. So we're using that ability where we're just directly pulling the product in from within Constant Contact from Shopify versus extracting the picture, saving it as a temp, importing it, et cetera. Yeah. So how does that feel in terms of like time savings for you? It's a good time savings, but I am having to remind our person that does that to test these emails Mm. because it was a really weird one where we were updating the photos of our baskets She created the mailing and then I changed the photo and the Uh, link became no longer valid and then sent out 10,000 emails and it just had broken broken link link. here kind of thing. Yeah. So, (laughs) You know, you mentioned finding that balance in terms of just how often you're sending to people. And so what is the frequency that you go in terms of sending emails and what have you found so far with that? So when I first started, it was pretty, I was super careful. I just didn't want to spam people because, you know, there is very much a burnout factor. But this year, the way Easter came so early, Easter was March 31st. It's usually like around now (laughs) or a week ago, you know, and then we have Mother's Day and we have Passover. We're finding we do unfortunately have to send out a little more mail than I would like, but you only have that week or two window, especially if people are going to order online and want the product ship. So we could be sending out three or four emails a week during these compressed holiday seasons. But then, you know, in the normal months, I try to keep it to less than well, maybe once per week or less, just because I don't want to have people decide to unsubscribe because it's like, ah, oh, another mail, you know, piece. Yeah. Well, are you doing anything from a like a list standpoint? Are you segmenting out audiences at all in terms of the contacts that you're sending to? I have not been doing that as well as I should be. It's just been one of those when I get to it and life only has so much time. Sure. So they aren't heavily segmented. We do have lists of corporate versus traditional retail buyer. A corporate buyer might be a constant contact that says, hey, we want to send out, you know, 100 gift baskets to, you know, our top customers versus a retail is, hi, I'd like a pound of sea salt caramels shipped to me. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you some information on the segments feature that we have in there. There's a portion of the product that will help based on criteria that you choose. We'll actually build some lists for you. Okay. That might be helpful to you. So, because I know, again, like time, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, I know yeah. I'm going to get there and do that. So that might be helpful to you as well. If you had to choose something, what would you say is your favorite constant contact feature? I like the way that it will auto resend to people who haven't opened the email. I'll dirty little secret. I used to use MailChimp mm-hmm. and they just, the product got more and more complicated for <laughs> no good reason over the years where it no longer became a nice little easy to use small business program. So when I first got here, she was on constant contact. And I was like, oh, I got to get rid of that. I got to go to MailChimp because it's what I knew. And then when I actually started using it, I realized, you know, 
this isn't bad. And <laughs> in the end, I'm actually finding it's much easier and it's much easier for me to have my staff use it. MailChimp, you practically have to be now an IT person to understand the way they set up their list management and so forth. Anything you do to build those lists up? I mean, you've got a pretty decent size list. Like obviously things are coming from Shopify and things right. like that, but what else are you doing? Currently, the only thing we're doing is, you know, uh, capturing all the new customers in. I don't know where else to get lists in a way that is meaningful. Like I said, obviously, I'm not going to buy lists. That's both illegal and very useless, right? Right. You know, uh, you're just going to get spam block. Whenever we go to do tastings and so forth, I am, you know, trying to capture more. It would be nice if there was a, like we have an ability, if somebody wants to do a Google review for us, we have a uh, NFC placard at the register. They can tap their phone. It would be nice if there was a, maybe there is, and I'm missing this, but a way where somebody could just tap their phone to it and now would be in our email list. Because I don't want to have to type in at the cash register what their email address is. Yeah. I mean, I think right now, the couple of things that we have, one is part of like the SMS add-on that we have. I don't know if text marketing is ever in the cards for you. I've thought about it and I'm like, uh, it's one of those I got to get to it, but I know there's a thousand rules around it, understandably so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we have a text to join feature on that. So somebody could just use their phone to kind of text you their address. But the other okay. piece of it is, you know, using a QR code and you can create one of those sign up landing pages, then people can enter their own information. So there's a couple of ways kind of around that to make that a little bit easier. But what would you say, what would it be like trying to run your business without constant contact? I don't know how we would communicate with the potential customer base about all the seasonal new items or promotions. It would be pretty difficult. There really is no way to mass communicate with 15,000 people anymore. You're not going to print and lick envelopes, that's for (laughs) sure. And I grew up in the direct mail industry, actually. I was one of the, I was 14 years old and built software for the post office's e comm system, which was a way where you could send out direct mail by putting it in an Apple II computer. It would use an old-fashioned modem, dial up the one of 12 post offices in the country. And from there, the post office would print your messaging, stick it in an envelope, and then postage it and send it out. So it was a way of sending out essentially email before there was (laughs) the internet or computers. And we were actually uh, doing okay with it. My dad had the business. It was uh, a lot of car dealerships were using it for Mm. you know marketing because so that was interesting. But eventually back in that day, MCI and Sprint. We're trying to do it as well, but they were much more expensive and they sued the post office, which is a government entity, is saying you're competing with five businesses and they shut it down. So huh. any stuff from the direct mail side of things that you are using today in many of your marketing? And not I wouldn't say sending direct mail, but just any tips that you've learned through that industry. You know, I mean, obviously you want to have the call to action there. You want to have direct links that get people to where they want. One of the things I've noticed lately, and I don't know if it's a recent change to Outlook, but animated GIFs now seem to work everywhere. Mm. In the past, they only worked on Gmail, but they didn't work in Outlook. And I've been starting to get direct mail, for example, from BJ's, which I don't know, it's like Costco. Yep, yep. And they had some Easter ones. I'm like, wow, that really grabbed my eye. And I saw the bunny walking. So (laughs) speaking of, that would be a nice enhancement for constant contact to have a library of licensed gifts Mm -hmm. that we could use because they definitely catch your eye in the inbox. Excellent. What would be your number one tip for maybe a similar business to yourself using constant contact? I think, you know, number one, getting some nice templates set up. I guess you have to hire somebody because not everybody can work graphic software. And then just investing the time it takes to get them out and don't delay. And once you get that full year cycle of emails out, then it's really easy the following years to just take and tweak versus, but that first year, you know, you just know that you're going to have to invest more time creating each of those message campaigns. Because of the the seasonality of your business and the way you're mentioning the year here, do you actually go through and calendar like when you're sending things? Do you do work like that? We probably should, but it's they're so predictable and you know how far in advance when people start buying certain products that it's just kind of in your head. There's only so many holidays that are big. Yeah. There's like six or seven of them for us. Got it. Got it. What would be your best piece of either marketing or business advice that you'd share with another business owner? Well, the business advice is know what your costs are and what the outside costs are that you can't control to make sure it all makes sense. But from a from a marketing standpoint, I think it's remember, you know, a lot of people cut marketing as the first thing when things get tight. That's the last thing you cut. 
you cut marketing, then you might as well close your doors because that's where your future revenue is going to come from. And the best time to really market is when times are slow. You're not going to have time to focus on marketing when your cash flow is coming in because you're so busy. So the time to be creating those campaigns and content is if you have seasonality in your business during the slower seasons. Well, friend, let's recap some items from that discussion. Number one, automate what you can. Now, Mark spent the first year as owner of Anjou Chocolat updating the business's out-of-day processes. This included automating as much as possible to keep things running smoothly while saving time to do other things. Make sure you're taking advantage of the automation tools available in your constant contact account so you can grow your business while getting back to the other things you'd rather be doing. Number two, use a blog for long-tail keyword recognition in search. Mark knows he's never going to win the battle in search when it comes to the word chocolate. The heavy hitters own those search terms. But terms like chocolate darts and chocolate dartboard can turn into orders worth multiple thousands of dollars. Now, in your Constant Contact account, you'll find tools you can add to help with search engine optimization so you can get more search traffic to your website. I'll include more details in the show notes. And number three, take advantage of seasonality to get things done. Mark mentions that the chocolate business is extremely seasonal. December does more than June to October combined. So during that downtime, the team is looking to update the website with the 50,000 moles that they have so that they can make people aware of them and, well, sell them. So use your downtime to focus on marketing because as Mark advises, that's where your future revenue is going to come from. And you're not going to have the time to focus on marketing when your cash flow is coming in because that's when you're so busy. Here's an action item for you for today. Try using the resend to non-openers feature. This is a simple yet powerful automation feature in your Constant Contact account. When you're scheduling your email to be sent, you can tick a box to resend the email automatically to people who haven't opened it. This gives you a second chance to get your message seen in the inbox. More details, of course, in the show notes. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Be A Marketer podcast. If you have questions or feedback, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me directly at dave.charest at constantcontact.com. If you did enjoy today's episode, please take a moment to leave us a review. Your honest feedback will help other small business marketers like yourself find the show. Well, friend, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and continued success to you and your business. Mm-hmm.